I'm here in New York at the Brooklyn Basketball Academy because today we're going to be looking at the math of basketball, answering such questions as, are you all ready for this? What? Copyright? Ah, we'll find a way around that. Y'all ready for maths? If you're unfamiliar with the game, in basketball you typically get two points if you get the ball in the basket. But if you shoot from outside the three-point line, which is a long way out, you get three points, a 50% increase. And I have the general impression that over the last decade or so, three-point shots have become more prevalent. Not just regular threes from the line, some deep three-point shots. So my first basketball stats question is, is that an actual significant change in the sport, specifically the NBA, or is it just a rough impression I've got, but it's not actually a fundamental change in how the game is played? And if it is, my second question is, is there a strategic reason for why that happened? And if that's also true, my final question, why didn't this happen earlier? Why did this change only happen in the 2010s? To answer these math ball questions, I'm joined by my friend Tim, who is currently in residence at the Museum of Mathematics, which is why you're in New York yep. and why we're doing this video. You normally work at, I guess you still do, at Davidson College, yeah. which is in North Carolina. So what do you do at Davidson? Well, I'm a math professor. I teach math and computer science, and I also lead a sports analytics group that started with three students and became 100. You've got 100 students <laughs> working on sports stats yes, and do. analytics, and yeah. that's so good. And you've advised the USA Olympic team, yeah. some NBA teams. Yes. Can you say what NBA teams, or is that? Uh, yeah, we're not really supposed to say that, but also the league office. What was that? Also the league office, just NBA. League office, yeah. The zeroth team. <laughs> And the one major question I had was, to my opinion, because I watched and played basketball in the 90s, <laughs> and I have not, I have, my abilities have gone downhill since then, but I've continued watching the NBA. And to my mind, the game, I'm not the first person to say this obviously, has moved out. Yes. And now, three-pointers are almost non-stop. So what we thought we would do is, first of all, have a look at the statistics. Like, is my impression of watching the NBA correct? And so you downloaded every single shot taken in the NBA between the 1997 season and the 2022 season. Yeah. So I've got literally every shot with the XY coordinates of where it is on the court. So if the shots have been drifting out, we should be able to see that. We just need a really nice way to plot them. Like a very fun, interactive, math, 3D plotting. If only we, um, Grant, Grant, yeah. if I got some data, can you plot it for me? Excellent. We'll do that. Grant Sanderson, who you might know from 3Blue, one brown very kindly took all of Tim's data and plotted it onto a 3D representation of a basketball court. And you can see as time progresses, the shots seem to move around in terms of where they're most frequent. But to have more of an insight, you know what, let's rewind back to some key years. So if you go back to, let's say, the year 2000, in 2000, you have these two spikes, big clumps of shots on the baseline on either side of the basket. And then you kind of got this forest of other shots from the top of the keyway out to the three point line. If you fast forward now until 2010, those clumps of shots from the baseline have moved out to the three-point line. There's suddenly way more shots happening out here, but you still got a pretty similar forest of shots from the top of the keyway. However, by 2020, we've now got almost no shots happening on the baseline, which used to be an incredibly popular shot two decades earlier. Loads from the three-point line out here, and then around the front, look at this great wall of three-point shots that is just solidified on the outside of the three-point line, and inside, there's this empty tundra, a desert, a almost complete void with no shots happening from the top of the keyway, just inside the three-point line, where these mid-range shots used to be much more prevalent. So we can see statistically, modern NBA players are taking way more three-point shots than their predecessors from two decades earlier. To find out why, we now did an experiment run by Noel and Liz, who were math fellows at the Museum of Mathematics, and they set up markers at 4 foot, 9, 14, 18, 20, and 23.75 feet, corresponding to various standard distances on a basketball court, including the high school, college, and NBA three-point distances. And I took 10 shots 
from all of them and we kept track of my data which looked like this so you can see close to the rim i'm getting well 60 percent 50 percent it's not great i'm out of practice that then drops off dramatically before an unusual little uptick which to be fair is two shots instead of one shot so that could be statistical variation it could be what residual muscle memory I have left from my youth making shots at the specific three-point distances. Who knows? The point is, I was more accurate up close, and then I actually dropped off dramatically as I got further out. And to make sure that's not just me, everyone then had a go. Everyone took ten shots from each of those six markers, including Beck, my co-host of the A Problem Squared podcast. And once all six of us had had 60 shots each, this is is the final plot. You can see, very similar to my shots, you're up 60%, 50% accuracy for the close shots. Once you get to the three-point line, that drops off dramatically. Although I suspect, for NBA players, they're a little bit more accurate. Do the maths if you wise, eyes on the prize. With a large sample, stats never lies. Should they take shots from the three-point line? I'm gonna plot with X's and Y's. Running the numbers as the coach nuts to the stats show. So I thought I'd work it out. I had the just over four and a half million shots taken over 24 years of the NBA that Tim had given me. And here you can see them all. I've plotted each year individually to start with. But the issue with that is because I'm running to the nearest inch, you get a lot of like these one off. Like this is a single shot taken in that season that went in. But because I'm running to the nearest inch, there were no other shots that season in that category. And if I was going to do this on a year-by-year -year basis, I would use bigger bins, like bigger categories. But I know I'm going to take all of the years, uh, all the way up to the 21-22 season, and combine them. And that gives us a much nicer plot. We've lost all that variability here. It collapsed into a nice, neat line. Once you get further out, though... We're back in the same situation. There weren't just that many shots taken this far out. And you can see there's a lot of times there was a single shot taken at that distance that missed. Hence all these zero points down here. So what I'm actually going to do is I think the useful data stops about here. And that's roughly where the half court line is. So I'm going to remove all the shots which are further out than roughly the distance of half court. Which just um, gives us this wonderful plot. We can break it down to three regions. You've obviously got the really close shots up here. I mean, this is people dunking at almost 90%. You've got, you know, pretty much at the rim. This is roughly 75% uh, chance of these going in. There's a weird spot down here. I think that shots that are just like so close it's awkward. But this is kind of the main event. And this tapers off uh, down to about here, which is approximately 48 inches from the ring or four foot and just coincidentally, that's where the restricted zone is in the NBA. If you watch an NBA game, or in fact a lot of basketball, this line here is exactly four feet from the center of the ring. And in this region, a defensive player can't draw an offensive foul from someone coming in trying to score. And it seems when you're this close, you're way more likely to score. I worked out it's pretty much exactly you lose one percentage point point of accuracy for each inch you are further away from the ring until you get down to here which is like the outside of the restricted area and then after that it flattens out it goes real flat for a long time although one thing i want to point out well, i got the picture up here is the backboard there you can see is like not up against the baseline it's further in it's like here-ish if i cut to a diagram of the court you can see the backboard is a little way in it's four foot in from the baseline, then there's like a six inch gap between the backboard and the ring, and then the ring is 18 inches in diameter. And so actually the center of the ring is five foot three inches in from the baseline. So actually some of these shots here were taken from behind the backboard, like behind the ring. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna change the data. So any shot where your Y coordinate, which is coming out this way, is negative, so it's behind the ring, I'm going to flip the distance to be negative. And this is what the plot looked like when I did that. I'm like, wait a minute, there's, there's way more over here. So if we rescale that, you can see here's our ring at zero inches. Here's all the positive shots from the front side of the court. And then this is behind the ring. So you have the kind of symmetric drop off here, but it gets way worse. These are shots from like behind the backboard, really awkward shots. And then this blur, these are shots kind of coming out along the baseline here. And they're spread out again because we haven't got enough shots in each category to get a good average like we do on the front. So I was like, you know what? It's kind of fun to see these, but I, I don't think 
that there's much we can learn from them, other than I quite like the fact we've taken them out of this data. It makes this data a bit neater. And just to tidy things up, I'm going to go back like to a negative restricted zone distance and lop off all the other ones. But these are just here to remind us that we have taken the negative shots out of our positive data. And to finish our tour, you have what I call here the, the, the big flat. This is at 39.6% accuracy. That's everything from the basket all the way out to the three-point line. Anything in here, it seems to be distance invariant. It doesn't matter where you're shooting from. It's roughly 40% precision. In fact, in recent years, this has gone up slightly. So if, if you just take the most recent five years, this line is at 40.8% accuracy. But over 24 years, it's 39 percent accuracy and the three-point line is about here and then your accuracy starts to drop off after that but we're not here about accuracy we're here about points so first of all i'm going to rescale this down so we've now instead of going from zero to one we go zero to one then all the way up to two which means as well as plotting accuracy we can also add in points if you put the points on exactly the same diagram you get this curve so up until the three-point line, it's just this one doubled because you get two points when all of these go in. So that's the average number of points you're getting, which means the big flat here is around about eight points per shot. And then here you've got the three-point line. And this is a slope. It's not an abrupt change because the three-point line is not a set distance away from the basket. So from the ring straight down here, that's only 22 feet away. But then as you go this way, it gets longer and longer and longer and longer until here, that's 23.75 feet. And so you've actually got this kind of a transition in the distance. And I didn't split them out. This is just the distance and the average number of points from that distance because I could pull the points out separate from the data. I wasn't using the distance to determine what kind of shot it was that's labeled independently in the data. And you get this huge jump up here, and then you get basically the same plot from here. This is after, all the shots from here are after the three point line. And so this is just this plot, but now multiplied by three, as opposed to this plot over here multiplied by two and the transitional zone. So what can we learn from this? Well, the first thing I did was I took all the shots which are uh, one foot past the three-point line at its maximum extent. And for that single one-foot region here, the average points per shot is 1.12. And you're like, wow, that's, that's amazing. 1.12 points per shot. If you want to get the same value over here, you've got to be 26 inches away from the ring. That's two foot, two inches before you're averaging 1.12 points per shot on average. So it turns out taking three point shots gets you the same points on average as being about two foot away from the ring. Like that's absolutely incredible. This is way higher than I expected it to be. And then this drop off, this drops off a lot slower than I expected. And yes, that's a spread out because there are fewer attempted points per inch I probably should have used bigger categories out here, but I could still draw a line from this. And I worked out when this dips below the big flat and it's at seven foot past the three point line. You need to be seven foot out. Put that in context, here we've got the three point line. Here we've got the middle of the court and seven feet out is about here. It's 30% of the way out to the middle of the court. So shots from out here. I mean, these folks are all about seven foot tall. If you have a single like metric basketball player out, that is where you're going to get the same points on average shooting as you would anywhere in here, anywhere outside the restricted zone. If you're shooting in here, you're getting the same points on average as shooting all the way. I mean, these are some deep threes out here. And actually that's Steph Curry. He's kind of the mascot of this change in basketball, who, fun fact, went to the same college where Tim works. <laughs> it all comes together nicely. And Tim remembers when Steph was playing college ball there and just how revolutionary his style of play was. And of course, because it's Steph Curry, he just nails that shot from all the way out there. I mean, the, the, he's, he's not human. It's absolutely ridiculous. And so what this plot is showing us is why we're taking so many three-point shots now, because the average points you're getting all the way out here, I mean, for a long way out, for the seven feet out from the three-point line, you're getting more points on average than if you took a shot anywhere inside the paint. And just for comparison, here's our plot from earlier, our precision, and if you multiply that by the number of points you get for each shot, you have pretty much exactly the same curve. I think this is you know, identical to the NBA, <laughs> really. I just went for the NBA threes. I didn't do any of the closer three-point lines. So you just get this tick up at the end. So there you are. This, this is us, as you can see, indistinguishable from the NBA. And the moral of the story is, why would you get 0 0.8 points per average here if you can step back a few inches and get 1.1 points?
So we know NBA players are shooting from further out. We know they're doing it because they're getting more points on average from those shots. The remaining question is, if the NBA introduced the three-point line in 1979, why did it take decades until the 2010s before the average shot distance moved out in a substantial manner? One of the big things is that there was a presumption that this kind of mid-range shot, not close and not beyond the three-point line, was not as efficient, but people were used to shooting it. It was when the shot data came that they could study it carefully. So it really was the data that convinced teams that the mid-range shot was inefficient and it was worth training for three-point shots. Um, I have a question, actually. So when, when they said, oh, it looks like three-pointers or something that's a little bit more uh, higher expected value for the points, was that based on the existing shot data or were they saying, assuming you train for that and like you specifically change the way that you coach and you change the way that you train, we could bump it up such that the expected value for threes is bigger? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think part of, I'm not quite answering your question, but in terms of the, the change in the game is that for certain players in the game at that time, it was still very true that they were shooting three-pointers well enough that, that what we see today was efficient for them. But now the game has changed where some of the big players come out and shoot that, which was not true in the 90s when some of us played basketball a lot. <laughs> And it's not just basketball. Tim has a huge team of sports analytics data people at Davidson College, and they cover an incredible range of sports, finding useful insights that the coaches can use. We do men and women's basketball, men and women's soccer or football. We do American football, swimming, field hockey, baseball, and volleyball. A lot of times when we were beginning in any sport that we do, we work with the coaches to actually learn not only what's coachable in the sport, what's coachable for that coach. Saying, for instance, that you need a certain three-point percentage for it to be efficient for you to shoot from there is coachable because you need to practice until you have that. Um, saying, for instance, you're third in defense is not coachable because it's just, it's just a stat and it's like, okay, I don't know what to do with that. And one of the first questions, if anyone's trying to work with a coach is, what do you do with numbers? And what do you wish you could do with numbers? That's just the basic question and then you go from there. Is there a systematic kind of blind spot that people will have before they dig into the data or before you're able to come and help versus after? The two blind spots for the coaching staff, it's usually how much of their gut they want to go with. And so you have to be careful not to intrude on what they want because they may be right with they their go gut. Oh, 20% of coaches who use their gut do more poorly. <laughs> yeah. <versus those> who... <laughs> yeah. And then one of the biggest things for a sports analyst is that you kind of want the data to say what you already think is true about the game. And so you, it actually helps to have very math-oriented people who don't know sports very well and sports people who may not know the math very well and people in the middle, all part of a sports analytics team, at least in the group I work with. So you don't have the confirmation bias? Yes, exactly. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Context seems to sometimes matter. Like if you have stats on Matt's percentage, but he's very rarely given the ball, right? And it's, uh, he's only given to it in desperate circumstances, whereas the easy shots are given to the good players, right? Does that mess up when you're saying, oh, well, we look and like Matt's shot percentage is like 10%. But if he was given more credit, like if the coach had assumed, uh, you know, he's gonna make more and he's given more of the easy shots, it might, like by giving different coaching, you're going to change what the probabilities are. Yeah, right? there's like, two, does that factor yeah, there's in? two things with that. One is just literally sample size. So in every single thing we give coaches, we always give the sample size. We just say how many times it happened. Right. Because, you know, if you shoot once and make it, then, you know, you're amazing because you're 100 percent. The um, the other part that plays into that is is just the fact that you really have to be careful with the numbers in terms of will they hold like if you play really well for 10 minutes will you continue to play well for 20 minutes right and we can't predict that all the time so you just but you have to state that even though most coaches are aware of that at least analytic minded ones are some are but not more again at a gut level than an analytic level yeah i, I guess what i'm sort of getting is like is there a difference between do you consider differences between the statistics like the data gathered and then the probability like given some new assumptions given what you're going to do uh how do those numbers actually influence what you expect moving forward? Because oh, like, yeah. once you change the coaching, it changes some underlying aspects of how someone's playing and things like that. Yeah, so the... one, I, I think this answers that. One time we had a player who had really bad knees and we had, this isn't exactly what you're asking, but we were asked, he can only play for 10 minutes. 
what are the 10 minutes he should play in the mm, game? Yeah. Well, he hadn't played that way the whole season. So like we had to make the best educated guess we could of those 10 minutes and turned out that we did really well. But mm. there are of course examples where the coaches then went, okay, let's refine those analytics a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, that's those types of things. But it, you work hand in hand with the coaches and that's what enables good decision-making to happen. Mm. Now we saw your basketball progress before. <laughs> <laughs> but is it true that your wife actually has the highest shooting percentage of any player on the Chicago Bulls practice court? Yes, it, yes she does. She has 100%. 100%? 100%, 100%, 100% shooting Jordan mark. hasn't got 100%. Exactly. She's better than all of them. How many shots does she take? One. 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 <laughs> That's the important of sample size. <laughs> Just before we go, I'd like to thank Grant from 3 Blue one brown for coming down, playing some basketball, recording some stats, and Grant has just announced the third Summer of Math Exposition. This is a thing that Grant puts on over the summer where people who are thinking of getting into math communication can make a video, a blog post, an interactive, you know, they can make whatever they want, and it's a supportive environment, lots of feedback, lots of help, and there's prize money provided by my good friends at Jane Street. So if you've ever considered doing math communication, please do check out the link in the description below. And yeah, once again, thanks to Grant. I'm always hugely appreciative when Grant makes time to come and join me in one of my ridiculous mathematical adventures. I want to show you two things. Yeah. One of them is a little special something I got for you. So first of all, I got custom jerseys made. Did you get a pie creature jersey? I, well, no, it's just a pie symbol. Oh, okay. It's cool. just, it's yeah. just you know, just normal, the, the, normal pie. The math For symbol math. existed before the pie mascot. <laughs> sure, sure. So I thought, team math. This is player number pie. Right. Nice. And this is my one here. So on the back there, you can see. <laughs> oh, you customized got, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so got you're number three one four. square three one four. And I went as far as I could reliably get them to print digits. Fair enough. Of pie. Yeah. So my theory is, and this as song. much as you need to get to the moon. Yeah, ex exactly. There, so now I can play. I'm clearly team You're math. You're team math. But I thought, hang on. I can't order a shirt just for me. Are you, this is just off the top of my head. Are you large or extra large? Oh, you really get medium. Yeah, uh, okay, here we go. No offense taken. Right. I say, <laughs> I get more X's in front of my L as uh, the years go on. So, Grant. I guess the real question is what number you gave for me. Well, okay, well, well just off the bat, you also got pie. Oh, well, but it's team pie. Team right? pie, yeah. yeah, team math. Like okay. the actual proper number. And the reason you like... got that is because they could only print one design, so you've also got Parker. <laughs> so I'm also Parker. You've also got okay. Parker on the back. <laughs> it's nuts. Actually, I mean, <laughs> no, so you'll always think of me. <laughs> no offense, but this is a lot less touching than I thought it would yeah, be. Yeah, 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 good point. Thanks good for point. doubling your it's order. It's a non zero <laughs> amount of touching. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, I was anticipating a little design work, but that, <laughs> I'm trash. Team math, yeah, yeah, we're yeah. going to rock team it. Team math. Yeah. Let's do it. Y'all ready for maths? Thank you so much for watching the video, and Tim is the distinguished visiting professor here at the museum of mathematics where they have this fantastic hoop curves exhibit where if we put the ball in it will i've been told make a shot every single time nothing but net <laughs> strictly speaking anyway if you're anywhere in the new york area make sure you come down and check out my math it's really good fun do the maths if you wise eyes on the prize with a large sample stats never lies should they take shots from the three-point line Running the numbers is the coach nuts To the stats show what they knew in their guts Use a distribution, it's better than a feeling Dominate cuts and the other team reeling